It's Thursday the 20th of October, day four of Project Edwards Week of Action. In today's programme, our road trips will be in Leeds, Guildford and Leighton Buzzard. We'll drop in on a conversation between Cheryl Pinner from HCC Solicitors and Mark Turner of the Road Victims Trust. We'll be hearing what makes safer roads and roadsides with information from Transport Scotland. And we'll try to find out how motorcycling fits within the safe system, courtesy of Heidi Duffy and the Shiny Side Up campaign. We also hear from six experts on their personal favourite top traffic tech challenge. Each contributor has just 60 seconds to convince us. But we start with a visit to Leeds for a symposium looking at the role technology and human factors play in post-crash response. Today's event also saw the launch of the Leeds Safer Roads Vision Zero strategy, and our Stuart Lovett was there. Hi, we're here at Leeds University in the centre of Leeds City. Uh, where we are here for the launch of the Leeds Vision Zero strategy uh, being launched today in support of Project Edward Week of Action. And we thank the council, uh, the emergency services who have attended today and everyone who is supporting Project Edward uh, this week. So how are you as the political, one of the political leaders across West, York, West Yorkshire, how are you working in partnership to bring about that change which is required to reduce death and injury on our roads? Uh, so I'm the chair of West Yorkshire's Vision Zero Board uh, and the Mayor and I brought the board together which includes all uh, five local authorities, it's got break, SCAD, it's got people with lived experience, uh, it's got Highways England uh, and other key partners uh, all coming together to look at how can we eradicate uh, death and serious injury on our roads, uh, working uh, with the local authorities to develop their uh, Vision Zero strategies, uh, bringing together uh, all the key partners, uh, looking at having, for example, um, some uh, really hard hitting campaigns so that people uh, not, not just understand uh, the data, but at the heart, they understand that this is about people, uh, this could be about uh, their family member, uh, and it's not just about how they're driving and how they're uh, contributing to the problem, but it's about the implications, the consequences for them of no change. The starting point is the approval of the Vision Zero strategy, which I'm pleased to say was done at the Executive Board recently. So we, we have a strategy document that uh, all uh, councillors have signed up to. So um, we then start to work up an action plan, um, which we then roll out. And the key thing with Vision Zero, which, which is a, a massive project, which we're all uh, really pleased to be working on, is that it's going to require um, a lot of involvement from communities and partners across the city. And, and everybody needs to play their part. This is not about um, highways and transportation, being responsible for road safety we will do our bit um but this is a massive agenda because of the task in front of us over 400 people killed and seriously injured each year um roughly 20 to 25 people killed on our roads that's unacceptable we need to do something about it and to actually make inroads into that it's going to require a lot of people to do a lot of work and a lot of it will be around behavior change how because the the, the fatal reports that I see on a regular basis, unfortunately, relate to drink, drugs, mistakes being made. And, and the, this means that these fatal accidents, fatal collisions are avoidable. Our report from Leeds. Now, yesterday was National Safe Speeds Day, 24 hours of focused speed enforcement by police across the country, which started at 7 a.m. on Wednesday and finished at 7 a.m. today. Now let's hope there were some high levels of compliance across the country, but if there were any drivers caught speeding yesterday, many can expect to receive penalty points and a fine. Some, however, who are just a little over the speed limit may get an invitation to take a speed awareness course instead. DriveTech from the AA is a leader in fleet risk and driver safety management, including driver training. They're also the UK's largest provider of driver offender retraining courses, including the speed awareness course. We went to DriveTech's head office in Basingstoke to speak to Steve Winnett, DriveTech's product management and quality manager, about why these courses are so successful. The, um, the courses are for people who are classed as marginal speeders. So um, first of all, those that are um, 
habitual high offenders, you know, 10 miles an hour over the speed limit, these sort of thing, um, they actually do get the fine. Uh, they don't get invited on, on a course. So we're talking about a particular demographic, demographic of people that are, um, they've probably just had a lapse of concentration. So how can we help those people? That's what these courses are about. And the, the whole point about the education for those, those people is to say, look, we all make mistakes. We all have lapses of concentration. There are some things that we genuinely don't know. So why not come on a course? That they are, they are proven to work. Although some people do come back to visit us again, you know, it, it, it does happen. Um, and, and this is the nature of uh, behavioral change, isn't it? Um, if you think about it, um, we're trying to really get to somebody how they think. Yeah. Um, what are they thinking about when they're driving is not always about driving and, and that's the problem. And so they're likely to get caught again because they were distracted. It's very difficult to change habits that have been there for what, 30 years for some people. Um, and so we, you know, you need to keep at it. People don't feel they need driver training, do they? Nobody feels that they need uh, driver training. Um, but when they come on the course, they'll learn one or two golden nuggets that they genuinely didn't know. And they'll learn that quite early on. The reason the courses are successful is because we're sharing with them some information that they've not heard before. Um, they might have passed their test at 17, up to maybe age 20, something like that. And they've been driving for 30 years since. And they're likely to learn something that they either didn't know or that they've forgotten. It's not about telling, it's about informing. And so we try to do that right from the early stage. There's a little bit of Q&A, there's some quizzes involved in, in, in there, and we get people to think, uh, really think about the subject. And um, if you can in, in, inspire them to, to inquire a little bit more in that early stage, they're more likely to enjoy it. Can't tell people not to speed. That, that doesn't work. Uh, and, I mean, the, you know, if they... They, they know that already. That, that's not really what the issue is. Um, it, it's trying to get them to think a little bit differently. And, uh, and that means you need to, you need to challenge some opinions that people have. We, we, we don't want to tell people not to speed. That's obvious. Mm -hmm. We don't want to tell people not to use the mobile phone. Everybody knows that. What we want to do is get inside the head and say, well, why? What are, what are the situations that you're faced with? that result in you doing that. Can we challenge that instead and get you thinking about it differently? You know, if you ask somebody um, what's most important to them, they'll say, I want to get home safely. I want to get home for dinner, <laughs> you know, um, let's get home to my family. Mm. Th these are the most important things to people. Absolutely right. So what are the things that could happen to you that would stop that? And so ultimately, what we're trying to get people to do is be more engaged. We know that it's difficult to con concentrate 100% of the time for 100% of the journey. That's not going to happen. So what we need to know really is, well, where do you switch on? Where, where do you put your full attention? And where can you afford to take that little bit of a, a rest break? And there are cues all the time as you're driving. You know, the signs don't get put there by accident. That probably because of an accident, actually, is <laughs> the reason the sign is there. Once you know that, you begin to realize that the road actually is informing you and you're, you're getting those triggers to switch on at the right moment. And that's why people enjoy it. They're learning something. They're learning something about road design that they didn't know. And they come out the other end of it and they're thinking, you know what? That was a worthwhile course and I'm going to recommend it. Mm. You, you'll get a wide demographic of people on those courses from a, a young driver, uh, a, a delivery driver, a manager of a company, a director of a company, a wide range of people. And you'll often get uh, directors and managers of, of companies say, I want my people to do this, this course. Uh, is, is there a version of this? that that we could uh show our, our people and, and of course there is um and and so they'll they'll bring that in into their workplace because they absolutely have bought in into the principles that they, they recognize they've learned something that is valuable it's changed their approach and they're thinking my, my people are just as vulnerable as anybody else, but getting caught speeding or having an incident. We've got all sorts of issues around fuel efficiency and all this that we want to bring into it. 
this is going to help my people as well. And so this course often gets delivered in a, in a, a slightly different format for, um, for fleet drivers as well. Steve Winnett from DriveTech. Now, each day this week, we're highlighting a different pillar of the safe system with Transport Scotland. Today, we're looking at safer roads and roadsides. Safe roads and roadsides, part of the safe system. Scotland's road safety framework is underpinned by the safe system. Safe roads and roadsides are fundamental to this. The safe system recognizes that mistakes can occur that lead to collisions. However, no one should die or be seriously injured on the road as a result of these mistakes. The safe system pillars act as layers of protection for people who are at its center. And if one part of the system fails, the other parts will still protect. There are many ways to create safe roads and roadsides. However, it all begins with good road design, operations and maintenance. Our road network is constantly under pressure due to changes in the volume of traffic, as well as adverse weather conditions. Maintaining our roads is a vital part of ensuring their safety and resilience. Each element of the maintenance regime plays an important part in providing a safe driving environment. Roads that are designed with safe system principles can reduce the probability of road traffic collisions as well as the severity of collisions that do happen. Segregating different kinds of road users and traffic travelling in opposite directions or at differential speeds can provide enhanced protection for vulnerable road users and mitigate the severity of collisions. Because even one death or serious injury is one too many. Together, making Scotland's roads safer Safer Roads and Roadsides, the pillar from the safe system, as presented by Transport Scotland. Now, Project Edward wouldn't be possible without the support of our valued partners and sponsors. Our two sponsors today have been vital to our road trip. First up is Webfleet, who fitted telematics to the road trip cars for a feature we're going to be running in tomorrow's programme. They'll be followed by GridServe, who've supported the Project Edward road trip teams with complimentary access to their extensive EV charging network as we cross the country throughout the week. So this year, Webfleet are delighted to be the technology partner for Project Edward once again. Webfleet are all about improving driver behaviours through data and through insights. This year's theme of changing behaviours is an ideal match to our ideologies. This year will also demonstrate how safer driving can lead to more sustainable driving and less impact on the environment for all of us. We look forward to taking part in this year again. Hello there, my name is Sam Clark. I'm the Chief Vehicle Officer at GridServe. We are delighted to be supporting the Edward campaign. Uh, two reasons really. One is while the guys are driving through the country in their electric vehicles, they will need to recharge their batteries. They will also need to recharge their own batteries at the same time, having a good rest on the journey. So that's a safe thing to do and it's a good idea to take a rest while your vehicle is recharging. So best of luck guys, hope it all goes well. Project Edward is all about promoting evidence-led good practice in road safety, which is the basis of today's featured initiative from National Highways. Simon Turner spoke to Deirdre O'Reilly, who's Head of Customer Insight and Behaviour Change at National Highways, about the insight needed to unpin an effective road safety campaign and look at a specific example where research has driven the development of a new resource for fleet operators to improve vehicle safety checks. I'm here in Guildford today at National Highways offices and I'm here with Deirdre O'Reilly who's Head of Customer Insight and Behaviour Change. Deirdre, thanks for talking to us today. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your role and the part Insight plays in National Highways approach to road safety. My role is about using insights, be it market research, social research or behavioural science, to really help us understand who our customers are, what they think, feel and do. Because actually what National Highways is all about is connecting the country. 
Now we're here to talk about a new resource that's been created specifically aimed at uh, engaging fleet operators and those who drive for them. So I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about the insight that's led you to want to engage with that particular group. Freight and professional drivers make up a huge proportion of people using our network and they are incredibly important. They are key workers in the economy. And so one of the things that we felt and we know through behavioural science is that the way to influence people is through a number of areas and one of them is through their employers. So Project Edward is all about showcasing initiatives that support the safe system, which means they're evidence-led. What research has been done to underp underpin this particular initiative? So we worked with Ipsos to really understand what the issues were and what the behaviours were that needed to be changed, and particularly habitual behaviours, for example, around vehicle checks. And they went out and spoke to the actual drivers themselves and to the fleet operators and to the organisations to see how they could do, get this to become more habitual and actually what were the barriers to making that behaviour um, real and sustaining that behaviour over time. So the first part of this resource is aimed at helping fleet operators understand in quite general terms how to implement uh, something at work that will drive behaviour change uh, of some form with their driving population. So can you tell us a little bit more about how that resource was developed? So what it did was look at how we can introduce um, road safety initiatives and taking that holistic approach. And it talked very much about what we call the COMB approach. And that's really a very simple framework. And it stands for capability, opportunity and motivation. And you need all three of these for um, initiatives to really work. Let's take a look at part of the behaviour change toolkit that National Highways have created for fleet operators. Supporting your people to drive and ride safely is an essential part of workplace health, safety and well-being. It helps reduce work-related road risk and can bring significant benefits to your business. Setting new habits for safer driving and riding at work is all about changing behaviour. Here are five steps for how to go about doing this in your organisation. The first step is thinking about which road user behaviour to focus on. Talk with colleagues, making sure to involve people in different roles. Share ideas about which road user behaviour needs to change most. And the positive results this will lead to. Step 2. Once you've chosen the behaviour you'd like to change, Ask yourself the following questions. What do people need to do differently? Who needs to do it? Where will they do it? When? How often? Step 3. Try to find out whether people know how and why they may need to change certain road use habits and whether they're able to. Are there other factors influencing people's road use, such as seeing how others drive and ride, or having the time and resources to do so differently? What about how people feel about changing their driving or riding? Are they motivated to do this, and do they see the value of it? Is it already part of their habits and routines? Step 4 For your initiative to work, it needs to tackle the biggest barriers you identified in Stage 3. For example, to build awareness and understanding of how to drive or ride differently, you could introduce training or communications. This can also help motivate people to change their behaviour. You could introduce role models to influence others or set new rules or guidelines. You should also factor in the time and resources your people will need. Step 5. Whatever you decide to focus your behaviour change initiative on, our final piece of advice is to test it out first with a small group. Ask people for their feedback. Make improvements and launch your initiative more widely. Then gather any relevant data you can to track progress such as vehicle condition or repair costs. 
good luck. If you'd like to find out more about safer work-based driving road use, you can visit drivingforbetterbusiness.com or contact incident prevention at nationalhighways.co.uk for more information and guidance. So that's a really great uh, resource there. There's lots of good knowledge to show uh, fleet operators how to engage with their drivers and uh, and drive behaviour change. Now we mentioned a specific instance earlier around trying to improve vehicle checking regimes within businesses. So that's the second part of the resource. Could you tell us a little bit about how you came up with that resource? Have, have you piloted it? Has it been shown to work? It's really important to do these um, checks and to understand, first and foremost, what do the organisations want to change? And they did come up with this idea that would really like their employees to do more vehicle checks, particularly of shared vehicles. And so, and how to make that more habitual, more embedded in their everyday experience. And it's quite difficult and challenging to change behaviours. But actually, it was more the processes around that, getting senior management buy-in, getting people to do the checks, giving them the time to do the checks, um, became very important. Deirdre, thank you so much for your time today and showing us how important insight is into development of effective resources. Um, those resources have been launched today and they're all going to be available for download on the Driving for Better Business website. So if you run a business or you're a fleet operator or fleet manager, go to drivingforbetterbusiness.com and you'll be able to access all of those resources. Deirdre O'Reilly talking to Simon Turner. Now, October is Tyre Safety Month, so we're going to take a look at tyres in this next segment. We'll do that with a brief version of a real-life tragic story that emphasises just how important it is to look after your tyres. On Thursday, 20th of February 2020, 22-year-old Megan Byrne was driving back to her hometown. Megan had recently qualified as a primary school teacher and was excited about the future. She had a fantastic spirit about her. Um, she had such a zest for life. Every single day she lived and she lived it to its fullest. Her character was absolutely wonderful. You know, she would, she would fill a room. Um, she had a great presence about her. She was my daughter. She was a fantastic person. I loved it dearly. She had been staying with her boyfriend in Manchester and was on her way to visit some friends for lunch and then to see her mum. So she left at tea time to go to Martin's and she just said, I'll see you Thursday morning when I come to play netball. So I said, fine, no problem. It was raining with high winds. As Megan approached a left-hand bend, she lost control of her car, crossed onto the opposite lane and collided with a large family car. And then um, I took my phone out of my drawer and then um, Courtney, her best friend, had, had messaged me, Joe, have you heard from Megan? And I, I wasn't worried, I just said, yeah, she's coming for a tea tonight. The impact of the crash was so severe that Megan died at the scene. Police officer said, Joanne, you need to sit down, it eats Megan. So then I just said, oh, please tell me it's not bad news. And then they just said, yeah, she's been involved in an accident. So she's passed away. So. Police collision investigators confirmed that Megan was driving within the speed limit and was wearing a seatbelt at the time of the impact. However, Two of the tyres on Megan's car were underinflated, which contributed to the crash. I mean, it was a very unique set of circumstances, this collision, in that we were also faced with adverse weather conditions. There was uh, strong winds, uh, rain, sleet, surface water. Uh, but yeah, the, one of the contributory factors was that, that the, uh, the offside tyres of Megan's vehicles were significantly underinflated. Megan had run flat tyres on her car. And if they are underinflated, it's almost impossible to visually identify it. It can happen to anyone. It can happen to the best driver. It can happen to the worst driver. It can happen to the most expensive vehicle. It can happen to the cheapest vehicle you put on the roads. Check your tyres because they are one of the most important things 
on your car. It's certainly in this case, it's had a massive impact on the, on the driver of the other vehicle. Um, not only the driver of that other vehicle, but also the emergency services that attended uh, the scene and have dealt with the scene and the subsequent investigation that followed uh, is something certainly I'll never forget. Megan's crash was just weeks before her 23rd birthday. Her family miss her immensely. It is a lesson to definitely, it has taught me a lesson to definitely check my tyres more on a regular basis, you know, once once a week, once every fortnight, because I never used to do it. And it, it does bring it home to you, you know. Does. Just a shame that Megan's had to pass away for me to realise that. But that's why I, I want to try and help other people, you know, because I certainly don't want, want anybody else to go through what we have. Megan's crash highlights the importance of tyre safety checks and shows how driving with underinflated tyres can have tragic consequences. Don't rely on the tech. Go to all four corners of your car, put a gauge on it, and check it. And you can watch the full video of Megan's story online with contributions from her parents, and you'll find it easily via the TireSafe website. Let's now turn our attention to motorcycling, and specifically we're marking 20 years of the award-winning Shiny Side Up initiative led by Heidi Duffy from Nottinghamshire Police. Heidi, welcome to Project Edward. Let's start by establishing how motorcycles fit within the safe system. Um, I think um, motorcycle safety can benefit from the safe system, um, but I think we need to know more about how it can be uh, adapted, obviously, to fit those on two wheels, powered two wheels, that is. How do we gain a better understanding of risk reduction for those who ride motorbikes, scooters and mopeds? Well, I think by doing that, by actually looking at the different groups. So we're obviously, uh, Shiny Side Up is 20 years old this year. So we've seen uh, a big um, change from the leisure riders that we saw in uh, 2002, uh, who were um, overrepresented in the KSI killed and seriously injured stats. And now we're looking at um, commuter riders. Um, they're featuring, featuring far too high. Unfortunately, four wheels and two wheels don't always go together in the same road space. We've still got our leisure riders going out on a Sunday morning. We've also got the gig economy. So we've got, um, you know, young couriers out uh, delivering food and, and shopping at all times of the day and night. So I think it's um, establishing all the different groups and then finding things to actually uh, engage with them and work out what problems they are facing and how road safety charities like Shiny Side Up and uh, National Rider Forum can, can support them as uh, those on two wheels. 20 years of Shiny Side Up must have taught you a few things. Tell us more. Well, the first thing is that how sociable motorcyclists are. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, when we did go to events, obviously the pandemics, you know, sort of uh, halted us on that. But when we did go to events, they're just such a sociable group. They're really nice to talk to. They're, they're passionate about their two wheels. Uh, I mean, in 2002, uh, it was strictly a very short season for, for the leisure riders and they used to wrap up their bikes as soon as the weather looked a bit wet and a bit cold. And then, of course, they'd go away in the garage uh, safely wrapped up until the spring. But now, uh, with global warming, uh, we're seeing bikers um, using the bikes either for leisure, for commuting, for enjoyment at uh, 12 months of the year. And that in itself brings new sort of challenges to us. How are you finding out more about the risks faced by riders in the gig economy? What's the latest thinking? Um, well, the research is a very interesting paper from, I think the lady's name, Karen Gregory from um, from. Edinburgh, I think, uh, and we've been looking at her work, uh, and that's very um, interesting. Uh, we're working also with some of the um, gig economy uh, companies, uh, and um, I've been the company I'm particularly dealing with. I've been quite surprised their level of uh, care and support of their uh, couriers um, is 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 very good and very encouraging. 
um, and they're reaching out to us through the National Young Rider Forum and we're looking where we can add value to that by working in partnership with them. Adding value, what does that mean in practice? Uh, well, what we're doing at the moment is that we're um, promoting the Ride Free resource, which was the uh, sort of theory um, resource that the DVSA made. And we're working with one of the gig, econ uh, gig economy companies to make sure that's part of the recruitment process. So before they actually get sent for their CBT day, um, they will take the uh, Ride Free resource uh, and that hopefully gives them a bit more knowledge, uh, has a perception, observation, highway code, et cetera. So they're a little bit more informed before they actually get on the bike itself. Uh, so that's one thing that we're, we're promoting now uh, and DVSA are working with us to make it very accessible because uh, it is a free resource, very accessible to the young riders who are joining the, uh, the gig economy. Uh, so they're, they're a bit better informed before they actually go on the bike. Thank you to Heidi Duffy from Shiny Side Up. Now let's take a brief look at some fantastic footage from Scotland that forms part of its very smart Live Fast, Die Old initiative. We'll see one of four short but very scenic information videos for motorcyclists. Then we'll meet Ilias, Paul and Millie as they introduce the spectacular 80 mile ride in southeast Scotland known as the Devil's Beef Tub. I'm Elias Campbell from 56 North Motorcycle Magazine. I'm Paul Crossan and this is more about Millie and we're ambassadors for the Devils at Beef Tub. I've never been to the borders and not had my breath taken away. The scenery down there is just fantastic. You've got a lot of rolling hills and with that comes a lot of open roads. It really is somewhere where a lot of bikers should be looking. If you're sticking as a group, you know, you always ride for yourself. You don't take silly chances. Make sure you're in the right gear, make sure you're in the right road positioning, and then just enjoy the twisties. You need to be aware of the riders that are around you, and if they do fall out of sight, wait for them to catch up with you. The most fantastic scenery in the world. What's not to love? It's just peace and tranquility. It's just, just perfect. There's nowhere like it. Smart thinking there from Scotland and its Live Fast, Die Old motorcycle initiative. Now we've just one more day to go in this year's week of action, so let's get our social media update from Neil Dewson Smith for the end of day four. Thank you, James. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome along to the social media roundup for Project Edward Day Four. And we're focusing today on the safe roads pillar of the safe system. Um, but the first important piece of news that I need to put out today is the fact that our hashtag today has passed 36 million impressions and is still building as we speak. So it's been another really successful day for Project Edward out there with lots of our friends, partners and sponsors all sharing some great content around road safety um, with the Project Edward hashtag. And there's just one more day to go, so a big final push for the um, for the day five tomorrow will be great. Um, two tweets of note though for today. First one is from um, one of our partners, Webfleet News, who put something out today because they've joined the team down on the road trip at Leighton Buzzard. And in Leighton Buzzard, it started to rain. Um, and so the team have adjusted their plan accordingly. There's an important message there around road safety about how you adjust something when the situation and the circumstances change. And there's rain on the road, the circumstances are changing, we've got to start thinking about lights, wipers, slowing down. Have we got all our lights on or are we just running on DRLs? Lots of factors to consider around there. Um, and so the, the web fleet tweet said that the, the wet weather hadn't dampened their spirits and they were still um, fully enthusiastic for the day down there at Leighton Buzzard, but they changed their plans to fit. And it's an important message around road safety there is that you change and adapt your driving and your driving style to the conditions. Um, the second one is really a tweet from yesterday, but we only came across it today. And it's from the, the DVSA enforcement team 
and they've shared an image of a load that they came across in Tamworth where um, poor loading uh, had taken place, poor quality infrastructure on the trailer, uh, then a webbing strap had snapped, but a huge coil of cable on one of those huge wooden bobbins came off the back of the truck and landed on the footpath. Um, if we're looking at safe roads today as a strand of the safe system, well, we've got to think about safe roads and safe vehicles on safe roads. And by definition, a vehicle that's not loaded correctly is not a safe vehicle. Um, great tweet. Quite easily, quite easily, uh, particularly with Every Day Without a Road Death Project, Edward, this could quite easily have been a fatal um, incident um, if it had hit and struck somebody on the footpath. Um, so a good reminder to us all that um, we need to be absolutely on point when we're looking at the safety of our vehicles and making sure that they're fit for the road. Um, other than that, though, great day for social media for Project Edward, and we're looking forward to day five tomorrow. Our final road trip report for today comes from Leighton Buzzard, where Bedfordshire Council and Fire Service have been talking to local drivers. Darren Lindsay went along to see what was happening. Thank you, James. Um, it's obviously day four of the, the road trip, and we're here in Leighton Buzzard. And, and I wish I could honestly say to you that we've got spectacular weather here today. You can probably hear the rain in the background, but we've more than made up for that in terms of what we had here in terms of our attendance. Um, we've had the British Horse Society down here today. We've had the fire, we've had the police, and obviously we've had Bedfordshire County Council as well. And really the focus today has been on the safer roads. So I'll get back to you later on just to give you a bit of an insight in terms of what we discovered and who we spoke to. Bedfordshire is uh, obviously a landlocked um, county, but we've got the M1 running down to London, so it's one of the busiest uh, motorways in the UK. But we've also got some uh, other A roads, which are very well used, the A41, the A5 and the A6. Um, and we know through our data and the incidents that we're responding to that road traffic collisions are the highest risk to our fire and rescue service and to obviously our communities and members of the public. So you've got a mix of um, large towns, a motorway, arterial roads going on, but also, as you see from uh, some of these uh, banners around here, you can go around a the corner, there's lots of country rain, lanes, it's very rural, lots of villages. So people sometimes don't adapt to moving from a major roads to the slower villages. So, um, and obviously we can come across horse riders, there's a lot of that going on, tractors, farmers and cattle being moved as well. So people sometimes don't adapt or are not used to driving in some of the areas in Bedlamshire. But I think it's working with all our partners, including Project Edward, to really get that message out there about concentrating only on your driving, making sure you're rested um, before you leave, and, and not being under the influence of a lot of things. But I think the, the major thing that I see quite often is people using their mobile phones. Um, there's a bit around frustration sometimes as well. You know, when we do get large incidents, you see some people caught in traffic and then they make some manoeuvres with their vehicles and you think, well, you're just going to cause another accident. So it's just about... And um, keeping your skills up as well, I guess, really, because once you pass your driving test, there is no requalification. But, you know, you, you do need those refreshers, as we know from our own drivers, driving fire engines. Yeah, I mean, the modern technology that's um, deployed in, in, in brand new cars is, is quite incredible. Um, my own personal car, you um, if you're on, uh, on, on the motorway, with, which has been um, modified or upgraded to a smart motorway, um, if you're on cruise control, which is radar adaptive, it will actually um, pick up the signals coming from the overhead gantries. And actually, if it drops from the, the standard uh, 70 miles an hour on the motorway down to 60, the car will actually automatically adjust down to that speed, which I think is, you know, incredible um, use of technology. And also what it stops is that, uh, you know, the what we call the, you know, the tsunami wave of um, backwards and forwards in the traffic of, cars bunching up this that, and the other so if all cars were deployed like that you'd get a nice flow of traffic through smart motorway systems why are people taking more notice about having this third set of um, second pair of eyes inside the other um i always say that you know um that uh, a, a vehicle parked on a driveway or parked outside a business a van a truck whatever it is is absolutely no risk to anybody until you put the human person in it now human you know human uh, are infallible people you know what I mean? They, they, they make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, you know, and I'm not saying that a, that a vehicle will, will not make a mistake, 
But what I'm saying is with that aid and that technology being deployed into modern vehicles, it's giving you that extra warning. So forward collision warnings. Um, imagine you were backing out of a car park in a, in a, in a, in a supermarket. Um, it will actually tell you that there's a vehicle crossing or a person crossing behind you and actually warn you to stop that sort of incident of the small bumps, the small knots, you know, where injury can occur. I was um, a police, uh, road police inspector, spent a huge amount of my career doing uh, road death investigation and doing with more serious road traffic incidents, which is why after I retired, I wasn't ready to stop making a contribution. So I, I'm the only part-time member of the first staff on the team. I still passionately care about trying to drive that road death to get down yeah. uh, as near to zero as we can get. So uh, not ready to give up work. I've been doing this for the last six years since I retired, trying to make a general contribution to make Bedford's road safer, in, which is where I work at the moment. When I first started on road policing, the average number of road deaths daily was 10. We've halved that in the 20 years or so since that time. Some of that is through... Vehicles becoming safer, the technology that's on board to keep people safe, airbags, seatbelt retentioners, all of those sort of things. But there still comes a point where when you lose control of a car, there's a certain amount of energy put into the collision where the outcome is still going to be bad. So driver aids and all the things we've got to keep us on the road are ever improving and improving uh, the odds of uh, being hurt in a serious collision. But we still need to work on you know, the decision-making interface as an educating drivers to make sensible decisions. So, you know, be good at dynamic risk assessment and basically assessing like, the, con the conditions. Like on the drive here, there, it was torrential rain, thunderstorm. Um, you can you can spot drivers who are thinking about what they're doing because they reduce the speed because they're aware of the risk of aquaplaning. Vehicle lights come on and they drive appropriately to the conditions. But other people just rely. Um, basically think you know get lulled into a false sense of security and will barrel on when if you were thinking about how you drive you might think actually i'm going to take some speed off here because it's not safe to be driving at that speed um just because there's a speed uh limit it's not you know it's not the speed you it's always safe to drive that you know, fog is an obvious one where people slow down it may say that you can do 60 but you can't see far enough ahead to make that um, yeah. determination when people slow yeah. down but you need to think about other aspects of driving like um, uh, rain after a long dry period the, the, there's oil on the roads um, and every road policing officer in the country is the first day it rains after a long dry period they're all busy because there will be accidents because people continue to drive without really thinking about how they're driving uh, so Mark Simance, uh, Webfleet Bridgestone Company um, and I manage our southern uh, independent uh, resellers uh, so distributing telematics devices across uh, the southern part of the UK. Morning Mark. Um, it's our fourth day of the road trip here with Project Edward and we very much uh, support the safe system and one of the pillars of the safe system is of course uh, safer roads. Now we know that you are big in this game when it comes to the telematics and the installations and that and we're sitting in a vehicle here today with one of your systems installed which is doing exactly what I've just said there it's looking at the roads ahead but not just that, it's looking at the person that's driving on the road, which will be myself or you. Uh, can you just tell us a bit more about this equipment and the trends that are going on out there? And more importantly as well, how it's interacting with the infrastructure to make a road safer today? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you're referring to the, the Cam 50 that we have installed in, in the vehicle there. And um, it has a, both a driver facing camera and an outward uh, road facing camera with a, an active screen, which provides uh, in cab alerts to the driver if um, we determine that they are distracted for any reason. So be it looking at their mobile phone, eating, drinking, smoking, etc. Um, and we find that by giving that real-time alert to the driver, they're auto-correcting their, their behaviour. Um, not only are we looking at internally within the cab, we're also looking at externally around tailgating as well. So if we're noticing that the drivers are becoming too close to, uh, to a vehicle in front, again, they get a, a similar sort of alert. So we're finding that rather than moving away from penalising drivers, it's actually allowing themselves to self-correct their behaviour. Um, it's actually reducing the, the number of accidents and, and uh, involvement in, in dangerous driving uh, through, through that sort of behaviour. Now, it does also feed into the, into the fleet manager's office, so they have visibility of that. But nine times out of 10, the drivers correct themselves and, and it, it's, it doesn't become a problem that needs to be sort of investigated further. So one of the things about the infrastructure thing, and we've experienced it this week, is this range anxiety, but more people are moving across to actually say 
about giving you range confidence there. Well, why do I bring this point up? I, I think it's important because we want safer users on the road, um, which will obviously lead to safer roads as a consequence of that. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what's happening there to sort of uh, occupy that space so it does become safer in terms of the technology? Yeah, absolutely. So we're approaching it from, from two directions. So the first is around um, providing what we call a fleet electrification report. So it essentially provides insight um, to a fleet manager on their existing ICE vehicles as to which of those would be suitable to be moved over based on their sort of average daily driving distance. So. So as soon as the drivers get into the electric vehicle, they're starting from a position of, of confidence rather than an anxiety because they know that the, the, the insight has been there. It's been an intelligent investigation made and a decision has been made based upon that. Maybe only 20% of the vehicles have been moved over because the rest of the vehicles is not appropriate. Um, and then on the other side, we're looking at the infrastructure. We've plotted the infrastructure on our platform, but in addition to that, we're providing real-time information to both the drivers and to the, the, the fleet uh, managers on the uh, type of charger, um, the, the, pl the plug type that's required, um, whether it's available, whether it's in use. Um, so again, we're, we're moving the drivers towards a position of confidence where they're actually able to think about the driving as opposed to whether they're going to get there before they run out of juice. So we've had a, an interesting few hours here in Leighton Buzzards and once again we've taken just a moment to reflect on the day's activities. And a number of things I'd obviously like to share with you today. Um, we obviously had a, a visit from the, the Assistant Chief Fire Officer from Bedfordshire, and I think some of the really important things that were shared there is the geography um, when it comes to safer roads here. We have many of the main arteries uh, coming into this area and a mixed variation of roads to contend with. So just a very good point there to consider. Um, the subject as well about uh, technology came up, um, in particular telematics. Uh, the rule that we're seeing there, as you know, we're in an electric vehicle um, this week and a number of things were pinging on the car. Did we know what it meant? Yeah, thankfully we did. But one of the things in particular about uh, the telematics is, is, is moving the conversation away from this range anxiety to actually bringing in the range confidence. Uh, and we've said this today because it makes you a better driver, makes you more relaxed and therefore leading to be safer on the roads. So that was a, a good point that's been picked up today as well. And we're also very fortunate um, to have a, an ex-Roads uh, Police uh, Inspector here who had a tremendous amount of knowledge to share with us, uh, in particular on the theme of about changing minds and changing behaviour. So that's all we've got time for today. Uh, I'm hoping to get back to you uh, tomorrow, whereby we'll be in... That was Darren Lindsay in Bedfordshire. Now let's stay in the county and drop in on a victim support organisation covering Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire and Hertfordshire. It's the Road Victims Trust run by Mark Turner, who talked to Cheryl Pinner from HCC Solicitors about the difference they can make to families after a road collision. It's a terrible fact, isn't it, that every single day in the United Kingdom, five people will be killed on the road. And that's just an amazing statistic because if five people were getting killed on planes or trains, there'd be a national outcry. Yeah. But they're killed on the road and people don't really seem to bother that much. Now, we know from the Road Victims Trust, just across Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire and Hertfordshire, that 85 to 90 people are dying every single year. And that's leaving this massive uh, void for people, this huge trauma is caused. Now, thankfully now, I'm part of a charity that can provide face-to-face -face support for everybody that needs it, everybody who's affected. And I can tell you that makes an enormous difference, as you'd know from your world as a family liaison officer. Yeah, and I think it's so important that the victim's voice is gone. So it's actually now more so about the family's voice. And when you say, you know, five a day, that's horrific. And it's also avoidable if, you know, if people just didn't use their phones, if they paid attention, if their cars were roadworthy. But I think, you know, from, from my perspective, the work that you do within the Road Victims Trust is so powerful in starting the healing process for those families moving on. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. Now, one of the problems about road death is quite often is the word accident. People refer to them as accidents. There has been an accident. 
Well, I can tell you these aren't accidents because in 95% of the cases, these are human error. Mm. So something is going badly wrong there, but there's this complacency around the word accident. These are collisions that are taking people's lives. There isn't support nationally available for those type of people. I'm, I'm happy to operate in beds, cams and hearts where there is support. And we are able to provide that face-to-face -face, uh, service. And I know from the people that we deal with who've lost their sons, their daughters, their husbands, you name it, their lives are in absolute pieces. And the best that we can do is start to give them some tools to help them to start to cope again with moving forward. But sometimes their voices just simply aren't heard. You know, people are getting killed every day by people using a mobile phone when they're behind the wheel of a car. Now, driving is incredibly complex, as you know. Just because we do it every single day doesn't mean we're any good at it. In fact, if anything, we might be getting worse at it. Yet people think they can then add a mobile phone to that complex mix and get away with it. And look at the consequences. Absolutely horrendous. Yeah, and I think, you know, we're talking about death. But actually, sometimes I think the life-changing injuries, if they survive the collision, they are catastrophic as well. And then, again, it's the family's voice that needs to be heard thinking about the changes to their life, looking after their loved one, the impact of all the medical interventions and things like that. So lots of times I, in the police, I can remember thinking I'm really good at questioning, but sometimes I used to think and reflecting back, was I so good at listening? And I think that's absolutely one of the skills that you at RVT can give, that you listen to their voices. And, um, I, I, and I think that's quite unique in that you have the face-to-face, -face, which I think is, it's massive. For somebody who needs your service, they don't want to do it over the telephone. They don't want to do it via Zoom. They actually want that personal intervention because it's about somebody they cared for, somebody they love. And I think, you know, what you offer is massive in the beginning of their process of healing. Yep, and we know that that early intervention, if someone has lost a loved one, that early intervention is absolutely crucial working in conjunction with the police, because every time there's a fatal or life-changing collision, the one authority that's going to be there will be police yeah. officers. And if you can form a relationship with the police officers who can share some of that workload, and then we can use our expertise to help the people have a voice and start to work to different things. There's a huge amount of great work going on out there. Yeah, there is. You know, Project Edward, look at Project Edward, what's that, what that is striving to achieve. Look at the road safety partnerships, look at the Vision Zero, look at the safer systems. The answer lies in technology and engineering, education, a little bit of enforcement. But everybody's got a part to play in that. Mark Turner was in conversation with Cheryl Pinner. Now it's time for part four of the Driving for Better Business feature on engaging local businesses in work-related road safety. One of the most common challenges that local road safety practitioners have is continuing to engage business owners and directors after that initial contact. You might be successful at holding local seminars on managing road risk and your delegates leave with a commitment to improve, but do you have the resources and the expertise to maintain that new relationship? Quite possibly not. In this video, we're going to look at how the Driving for Better Business program can take on that task for you and the additional resources that we have to keep your local firms on a path of constant improvement. In the regional guide to Driving for Better Business, we showed you our seven step framework for businesses to follow. And this is how it works. Step one is to join our community where firms create a free company profile in our risk management portal to access the online tools and share resources. More than one person can have access to the account and contribute to that process, vital if we're talking about a large fleet or a firm with multiple depots. Step two is about understanding your responsibilities. It's not just about the fleet manager or the business owner, there may be other people in the business who need to understand this, uh, such as the finance manager or other directors. We've got a simple fact sheet to download and share with them. Step three is to evaluate practices. We have two online tools. The first is a benchmarking tool to show how a firm's accident rate compares to others. If it shows that there's room for improvement, then we have an online gap analysis tool that highlights any management gaps and identifies further resources that can help to fill those gaps. 
Step four is to strengthen culture, which is done by sharing our free resources, such as the Van Driver Toolkit, with your drivers to create a safe driving culture. You can even use our risk management portal to check whether drivers have opened the resources. Step five is about enhancing performance. This means monitoring a range of metrics linked to the business benefits that we discussed. Once a baseline has been set, business owners can see how much of an effect the other steps have had on achieving an improvement. Steps three, four and five form what we call a circle of continuous improvement. Road risk management is a constant journey, not a destination. So longer term, we're looking for businesses to constantly repeat these three steps. Step six is to demonstrate a firm commitment to continuing the pursuit of good practice. Firms upload a statement of commitment and can print out or share that statement with customers and staff. Finally, step seven is to encourage well-managed businesses to share their success story and the benefits they've achieved to inspire others to join them on the journey to make the roads safer for everyone. In the final part of this series, we're going to look at the different ways that you could work with the Driving for Better Business team on local delivery of the programme and its resources. Now yesterday, while the Project Edward road trips were crisscrossing the country, there was an event going on in Birmingham. The sort of event where you have to put goggles on and put yourself into a virtual environment. Can that work as a road safety initiative? Well, this was Ice Live. Here's a little taster of what was going on. Hey, it's Bill here at Ice Live 2022, the UK's first road and community safety VR conference supported by Project Edward. This is the first event of its kind, organized by First Car to showcase the best in tech, thinking and research in virtual reality right now. Since the UK's first VR road safety film was produced five years ago, dozens of organizations and authorities have been investing in this exciting technology. Ice Live brings all of these people together in one venue. Finally, in today's program, we're introducing six people who each have 60 seconds to persuade you to vote for their chosen top tech challenge. They contributed to a recent UK ROED webinar where there was live audience voting. We'll tell you the result at the end, but you're of course entitled to form your own opinion on which of these six systems and concepts gets your vote. Pitch number one. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Box, Research Director from the RAC Foundation, and I'd like to nominate Telematics Insurance for the Top Traffic Tech Challenge. Research has found that prompting people to self-monitor their behaviour and providing them with feedback on their driving performance helps to deliver road safety benefits. In-vehicle data recorders provide this, as well as economic consequences and incentives to further encourage safe driving behaviours. Telematic-style products have been particularly influential in delivering safety improvements in both vehicle fleets and through young driver insurance products, where the company or parents can also be engaged with monitoring safety. Technology that can support ongoing rather than one-off driver safety improvements are the systems that are best placed to deliver the behaviour change we need as part of the safe system, which is why I think telematics insurance should get your vote. Thank you. Pitch number two. 
Hello, I'm Neil Gregg, and I'm Director of Policy and Research for IEM Roadsmart, formerly known as the Institute of Advanced Motorists. I'd like to nominate for the Top Tech Traffic Challenge the SatNav. I recently found uh, I've been driving a car without a SatNav, and you realise that you're actually quite dependent on it when you've been driving with a SatNav for quite some time. They are so accurate now, they give you advance warning of uh, hold-ups ahead. They even give you advance warning if you put the scale up of uh, the nature of the road ahead as well. And what I've found is when I'm not having a sat-nav, I'm actually more nervous as a driver because I'm not sure what's happening ahead of me and around me because I'm not getting those messages through the sat-nav. Obviously, I program my sat-nav before I set off. But it, the fact that I'm getting a countdown to when I'm going to arrive, I can tell people when I'm going to arrive. I just feel the sat nav allows you to be much more relaxed as a driver and concentrate on your driving, which as an advanced motorist is obviously the thing you should be doing anyway. It gives you the full you know, width of uh, attention to actually concentrate on the, 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 the traffic around you because you know that the sat nav will tell you of delays and you also know when you're going to arrive. So I, I'd say vote for the sat nav. Pitch number three. Hi, my name is Florian Petit and I'm the co-founder of Blickfeld, a company producing cutting-edge LiDAR technology. LiDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging and is a technology which allows to see the world in 3D. Especially in mobility, it is of utmost importance to understand how far other traffic participants are away to drive safely. That is the reason why already today almost every autonomous test car has LiDARs deployed. And I believe that in the future every car will use LiDARs, for example, for advanced driver assistance systems. LiDARs are not only limited to cars, but can also be deployed in the infrastructure to, for example, find the next empty parking spot or optimize the complete traffic flow of cities. Pitch number four. Hi everyone, I'm Sean Hellman from TRL and I'm nominating the driving test for the Top Tech Challenge. Uh, the driving test has influenced the formative behaviour of drivers more than anything else. Put simply, if something is in the driving test, people are much more likely to practice it. For example, the introduction of sat-navs in 2017 stimulated over 95% of candidates to practice this in their lessons. And the addition of hazard perception testing in 2002 convinced candidates to practice this critical skill and reduced collision risk in test passes. Now, the test is not perfect. For example, it cannot assess how risky people might be when not under the scrutiny of an examiner. However, we can improve it, and the content in the test, which we can and do change over time, makes it clear to people what needs to be practiced to enter the driving population. And candidates and instructors change their behavior in response to this test content, making the driving test for me the perfect behavior change intervention and opportunity in road safety. Thank you. Pitch number five. Hello, I'm Edmund King and I would like to nominate the seatbelt for the Top Traffic Tech Challenge. Why the seatbelt? Well, it just saves lives and it always has. DFT claim it saves 2,000 lives a year. Rob Gifford, back in 2005, when with PAX, claimed it had saved 35,000 lives over the previous 25 years. So it saves lives and it could have saved more. Diana, Princess of Wales, died in one of the most talked about and tragic crashes of all time. If she'd worn a seatbelt, she could have survived. That was the finding of Lord Stevens, ex-commissioner of the Met Police. Yes, driverless cars and future technology will help. I've been in a driverless car without a seatbelt. It stopped suddenly, it threw you forward. You still need seatbelts. So vote for the seatbelt. It will save lives. Thank you. Pitch number six. Hi, I'm Katia Loyos from the European Transport Safety Council and I'd like to nominate Intelligent Speed Assistance, ISA, for the Top Traffic Tech Challenge. Driving too fast both increases crash risk and crash severity. Intelligent Speed Assistance is a fantastic technology that helps drivers keep within the posted speed limit using a combination of GPS, digital maps, and camera reading signs. The good news is that uh, ISA is mandatory on all new vehicle types sold in the EU as from July this year. 
The bad news is that the UK so far has not put in place the same safety requirements. And this is, it's a shame because the UK was closely involved in the research around the ISA benefits with Leeds University and Transport Research Laboratory did the analysis for the European Commission um, that led to the adoption of the safety uh, requirements. So come on UK, get a move and mandate ISA on all new vehicles. And to all of you in the audience, please vote for intelligent speed assistance as a top traffic tech. You know it makes sense. Six compelling presentations, but only one winner, which in this challenge was the seatbelt, closely followed by black box insurance telematics. And thanks to UK Road for use of that footage. Well, that's the end of the programme and our fourth day of the 2022 Week of Action. Thank you to everyone who helped with today's events and thanks to our partners. Thanks, of course, to you for watching. Tomorrow will be the final day of this year's road trip and the teams will be visiting Durham, Warwick and Gloucester. I hope you can join us then for our last programme of the 2022 Week of Action. But for now, from every member of the Project Edward Week of Action team, it's goodbye. Thank you.